Hey everyone, how's it going? Just gonna check this out. Let's test that the stream is working first on Twitch and then also on Facebook. All right, should be running. Let's see. All right, so I can see myself on Twitch. Let's see if I hear myself. I heard a keyboard click. Right, so I can see myself on good. Twitch. All right, so I can hear myself on Twitch. So that's good. Let's check out the Facebook link. Hmm. Strange. It says live video should start soon. Twitch is running. Facebook is stalling. Well, I'll come back to Facebook. Hiya, Twitch. All right. Bloop, bloop, bloop. That's so strange. That's never happened before. That is so weird. Right, I'll have to come back to check on Facebook, but apparently stream is running on Twitch, YouTube channel, so it should theoretically be running on Facebook, so I'm just going to get started. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me in this stream. I am Eamon Akhtar. If you haven't heard of me before, uh, I am a 3D artist based out of Los Angeles, and for the past four years, I've been doing a lot of 3D printing. So you can see some of my projects on my site, Eamon3D.com. Um, some really big prints, some small prints for stop motion animation, some concept art and like toy making prints, toy prototyping prints. Uh, I got really into toy prototyping and all sorts of 3D printing, really jewelry, fashion, wearables, uh, prototyping. Uh, for the past few years when I moved from Chicago to LA, and then I wanted to kind of add to my resume beyond just being a modeler. I wanted to be a modeler plus something. So... I kind of jumped onto and embraced 3D printing. Um, that kind of led me into a path where I opened my own company. I freelanced around a bunch and then I started to make my own toys and I launched my own toy line called Fungosaurs, little dinosaur mushroom hybrids. So that's kind of what I use this stream for. I kind of use it as a time to design some more of these little cute creatures. The toys are in production right now and hoping to release them this November so it's kind of exciting using 3d printing to prototype something and bring that idea to reality you can follow my fungusaurs on fungusaurs.com as well as any news related to them scrolling down in the fungusaurs Instagram I post a lot about like factory post-production and actual production and then now I'm switching gears to the augmented reality game because that's one thing I'll be working on a lot is trying to make these creatures from the toys come to life in your phone. So yeah, follow that stuff there. And if you want to see any of my previous streams, you can go to pixelogic.com ZBrush Live Presenters and you can see all of these awesome presenters here. Uh, in about an hour or so after mine, uh, Shane Olson does his broadcast, so today at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and he's an amazing artist. So I highly recommend you stick around to check that out. If you scroll down, see, here I am. You can see some of mine. And you can click on my work. You can see a bunch of my past streams. And this is officially stream number 10 for me for ZBrush. So that's kind of an exciting milestone. Happy to be here doing that. Uh, you can see most of the streams so far have been, you know, the fungusaurs. And then I took a little segue to work on a, another personal project, which was a 3D printed scale mail armor suit. So that was like an Aquaman underwater shoot that I did. And let me show you what that turned out as, because I just got the final photos. I think these are it. Yeah. So these are the final photos of the Aquaman Infinity Armor suit that I came up with. And that's me, actually underwater. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a fun little underwater shoot that my friend uh, Brett Stanley and uh, Jessica Drew put together. 
So trying out all sorts of fun poses, listening to a lot of directions, trying to hold my breath but not do this face. And I'm pretty happy with how a lot of these photos turned out. So I'll be sharing them shortly. I think that's about it. Oh yeah, this one. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how many sharks to add into this one because I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, Aquaman poster. Let's see if I can find it here. But that just made me laugh so hard that I kind of wanted to... Uh, Replicate it. Let's see. Choo, choo, choo. Thought it was here. Save the copy offline. Aha, there it is. Look at that. I got to do something ridiculous like that with just that many sharks and orcas and dolphins. <laughs> we'll see. That's what this might turn into. All right. So, uh, going on to what I'm doing today, there's a couple of things I wanted to get started. Let me double check that maybe it's working on Facebook Live now. Hmm. Very strange. Because I can see myself and everything's working fine on Twitch, but not on Facebook. Very strange. I'm going to check if it's this OBS plugin that I'm using. This might be fun for you guys. Check this out. It kind of creates like an infinity mirror situation every time I pull up this uh, window. Whoa. It's fun. Let's see here. Oh, everything looks to be set fine. Because you have to set it using this OBS plugin for Facebook and Twitch and everything. But this is the same settings I've been using since I started streaming. So whatever is happening on Facebook, I think that's on Facebook's end. Alright, I'm just going to barrel forward because can't seem to control that situation anyway. So there's a couple of things going on right now that I think would be cool for you guys to see. I like to usually start these streams with a bit of show and tell and then jump into... Uh, whatever I'm working on. So you can see I changed my background setup a little bit. I put the 3D printers over here. There's my Form 2 for stereolithography 3D printing and my Raise 3D N2 Plus for uh, FDM printing. So much larger scale, much more prototyping and smaller scale but detailed. Because of that detail, I got commissioned by a client to make a ring. Something like this. I don't know if you guys can see that. But basically, prototyping a ring. And so I've got a new print. So if you guys would like to see, this is how I remove a print from the printer. All right, so first thing, I grab some gloves. Very important to wear gloves when you do this kind of thing, especially with all the resin. You don't want sticky resin getting on your hands and it also makes you feel like Dexter the serial killer alright this is pretty straightforward you lift it up pull up the tray and take it out now I can see by looking at this that I had a failure I always try to print when I'm doing small things I do at least two at a time because sometimes prints fail case in point right there uh, and at least now it looks like I've got one that's good and one that's gone so yeah it's just a good recommendation when you guys are printing something and there's a client and there's a deadline try to print more than one because this printer you know for me it's been working like a solid rock I've been printing something every day for a year or but I've noticed that uh, it might be time to send it back to the factory for a check because it's giving me more failures as of this past month um, that could have been because I moved, could have been for any number of reasons. But it's got this wiper that can swipe down the tray. So even if you have a print fail, it'll kind of swipe that away so your other prints will keep working, printing just fine. It's not like you get one failure and the whole machine, you know, everything that's printing fails. So what I'm going to do first is just remove this from the build tray. Use something like this comes with the printer and 
pretty straightforward, but I want to be careful I don't spray it around everywhere because I don't want to get resin all over my desk. This is the failure, so I'm going to toss that. And then pick up the ring. That's right there now. And I'm going to dip it in isopropyl solution. So I've got 90% isopropyl here. Drop that in there. Okay. And I'm going to take a bit of paper towel and wipe down and clean my build tray, put that back in. Since I also had a failure, there's probably something stuck to the bottom of the printer, so I wanted to take that off as well. Wiping this is pretty straightforward, just with a paper towel. Whoop. And what I'll probably do is take something like this and just scrape a little bit. Get any excess pieces off. Not sure if you can see that, but it just creates a little bit of a line of resin that it sees. So you can remove that too. kind of my morning routine almost, just to take a print out of the printer, or one of the printers. I've been doing a lot more printing recently in the FDM machine because I've been prototyping. All right, so that's good. I'm going to put that back in. And it's hard to show you guys because the printer is a bit far away, but there's a little bit of a sliver. that failure that caused it kind of attached this little bit to the bottom and so I just have to take that up and that should be it that should be good just double check move the wiper around spatula around a bit I see a little bit more junk so I'm going to get that out of the printer as well You gotta be careful with the surface tension. Sometimes stuff doesn't want to come off easily. All right. Here's a little part of the failure. So I'm gonna to toss that too. You don't want to leave this open for too long. There is enough UV light in here where the resin is going to start to solidify. You do want to keep your printers away from windows, at least the uh, resin kinds for sure. I'm just going to clean this spatula. And this is good. So now I'm ready to start printing and testing again. Like I said, I might have a chat with Form Labs and see if they can check this printer out. They do have pretty good customer service. And send me a refurbished one or see if there's anything wrong with this one, laser wise or otherwise. All right, so now that that's done, and this print's been soaking, let's see, I'm gonna mark this as failure. Turn the printer off. All right. tools away. So this print has been soaking in isopropyl for about a minute or two. I'd probably keep it soaking, but it's a small print. And so the way to think about it is if it's a big, heavy, solid print, you want to soak it in isopropyl for 15, 20, maybe even longer, a minute. But if it's a really small, thin piece, like a ring or something like a pin sword or something, the longer you keep it in isopropyl, the more likely it is to warp. And you don't want it warping. So I'm just going to take it out shortly and check it out. I'll do sometimes multiple isopropyl dips and wipes to make sure the print looks good and there's no issues. This side looks good and that side looks good. Sweet. 
Yeah, so this print is probably the best one I've had, which is strange. I printed this ring now a few times. But there you can see that ring. Woo. And you can see how it's coming off the supports. How I, how I basically placed it on the uh, printer so that it would print vertically and do the least amount of damage to any of the actual art on the side. Yeah, Here's one that's been removed from the supports. But this looks pretty neat. I'm pretty happy and stoked with this. I'll clean it up later today. When I did the one isopropyl bath, and this side is kind of my dirty isopropyl solution that I've been using for a month. And now I'm going to put it in a clean isopropyl solution, which is more of the, you know, like a new bottle every week or so. And so that's a very clean solution. So it's just kind of a second soak. And I'll take that out in, I don't know, maybe like three or four minutes. Take off my gloves for three or four minutes. And shrink this window back down. And let's get loaded up on what we'll be streaming today. So I wanted to work on another one of my fungusaurs and there's a few different things I wanted to do so let's see how much I can actually get done today okay stream 10 man can't believe it's been 10 already alright loading these guys up and let me also load up one of the guys from the previous stream or two streams ago One of these. There we go. Okay. Do 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 do. All right. So this is a little Stegosaurus mixed with a random green yellow mushroom. I haven't figured out which one I wanted to use yet. Uh, just kind of went with the mushroomy shapes. And this was the first one I made and kind of finished off on the stream. Also did a test print on it using Shapeways. Gosh. And there, color 3D printing option, which you can see right here. So that's one. And wanted to move the next couple that I started to the same level. So I'll leave that down there and switch to this guy. So this is the next one that I kind of painted up in the last stream and it is a Dilophosaurus mixed with a pig's ears mushroom. That's what this one's called. Yeah, fungi are fascinating. They come in so many different shapes and sizes. It's like the perfect thing to, perfect organic thing I feel to mix another species with. And so I want to kind of develop this IP and tell a whole story. See about having video games, toys, uh, plushies, having an animated series even. We'll see. All right, so there's the Dilophosaurus character. Turn perspective on. And let's pose him over here. And the one I wanted to kind of work on today is this guy. The third one I started on ZBrush Streaming. He's not done. Obviously, you can see the eyes are really mushy. So that's probably the first part I'll work on today. Feet are a bit mushy. Hands look pretty good. They look a bit human, but I think that should be all right in terms of what I'm going for. Kind of something cute, you know, cute and appealing, especially with this one, just kind of giving a thumbs up. And that's what I feel like Iguanodon always do. I feel like they're always giving a thumbs up. If you guys don't know what an iguanodon is, that's this type of dinosaur. Uh, it's kind of famous from the actual dinosaur movie uh, by Disney. I think you can see like that one. That's the actual toy of it. Let's see. 
But I always think Iguanodons always seem to be doing a thumbs up because of their thumb sticks. There you can see again. <laughs> I guess that's one of the proposed reasons for why we think they have these thumbs. Is so that if an Allosaurus or something came after them, they could just kind of stab it or use their thumbs as little weapons. Because their arms are a bit longer than a lot of the other uh, dinos. Because <coughs> they could walk kind of on their forearms, but they could also stand up and be vertical to kind of reach the plants on the trees is I guess what scientists and paleontologists assume um, and just make themselves look bigger than they were. Um, I thought mixing this iguanodon would go really well with a two-colored bullet, which is a really nice colorful thick mushroom. Uh, it's got like purples in it, yellows, pinks, so it gives you a lot of different colors to play with and that's kind of what I wanted to experiment with this one. Uh, for the green one for the stego, I was actually thinking I might go glow in the dark and have a glow in the dark one in the next series, which would be pretty cool. Let me show you another update. Which is that for series one, I've got a box. This is almost this is actually the final prototype I went to pick up from the factory. Let me make this window a bit larger so you can see what I'm showing you. Yeah, so there's the actual finished prototype box that I hope to get in store soon. Get that nice and positioned. Whoop. Okay, there we go. So like an actual you know, professional looking box set. My wife, Fa, uh, she's the designer on this project. She did all of the uh, package design and look development for all this stuff. I did all the sculpting and character stuff. And so that's how we came up with all the packages. And there's eight fungosaurs in series one. Let me pop these open. We're trying to open the boxes from the bottom so I can keep using this display. And this is how they'll come in. And this is an actual sample from the factory. So we can see that the paint job is actually pretty dope. And I like what they did at the bottom of the box. Whoop. Or at the top of the box. It's kind of like a stair-stepping thing going on in there. Or kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It's basically like this happening in the top of the box so you don't really know what toy you're looking at from the top of the box if you were to open it also it it basically prevents any extra movement in the packages because now they take up so much more of the space that when you shake it it's not going to shake a lot so simple things like that so i've got fungusaur series one all done and i just need to get it, some distribution deals on these guys and hopefully you'll see them in a store near you soon. So now what I'm working on these guys you see on screen is series two. All right, before I do series two, it's been about three or four minutes. So I'm gonna take that ring print out of the isopropyl bath. <coughs> Don't want that to start warping. So I'm going to put my gloves back on, because isopropyl, like resin, is a chemical. You don't want unnecessarily getting chemicals on you. You don't want to breathe them in, you don't want to get them on your skin. Just wiping away this extra isopropyl. And I will probably remove the supports later carefully with a uh, modeling clippers or X-Acto knife blade. So for now, I'm just going to leave it right here. Okay. Done with that. So it's that pretty much that easy to work with 3D printers, even with a failure. If you kind of know what you're doing, it doesn't slow you down too much. <coughs> okay. I do teach a full course in 3D printing for ZBrush artists. 
uh, right now in the process of upgrading that lesson and it'll be on Mold 3D Academy. Let me see. Let me shrink this back down. You don't need to see my face that big. Alright, and I will check Twitch shortly to see if there's any questions and stuff. Alright, there's Twitch. You can see yourselves, guys. What's up? Hey, Kurt, what's going on? Thanks for joining me again, Joanne. I feel like I have, like, a regular following with you guys. Thanks for showing up. Let's see. Is that one of those dip printers? Yes, Boil Spud, that is uh, the Form 2, if you're referring to, is a uh, stereolithography resin printer. So it's the liquid resin that when a laser hits it, it kind of becomes solid, 90% solid, and then eventually you can pull it out of the tray. Kind of like, you know, a little Terminator. All right, Brave Hun says, hello, hello. Nice details, thank you. Looks like a flower. I agree. That guy, little dude looks like a flower. All right. Mushy seems like a, something a mushroom dino would do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I am a great businessman. I would like to think so. We'll see. Most businesses fail. So I, I have uh, no crazy expectation. Uh, 254mm Nick Hall is saying, how do you like the Z18? I don't know what you mean by Z18, so I'm going to look up Z18. Replicator Z18 3D printer. Okay. That's this guy right here. Oh, okay, so it's the MakerBot. I have used this one before. Whoa. Why did it just go to nothingness? All right, I'm going to look in images. <coughs> All right, so the Z18 is MakerBot's large-scale printer, and... I have used MakerBots relatively extensively. Uh, I use the fourth generation one a lot, and I contracted out to other people who had these printers to get samples from them, to get prototypes. At the end, I ended up going with the Race 3Ds N2 Plus because for the price range, it was just giving me something a lot bigger. This is 12 inches by 12 inches by 24 inches. Uh, let's see what the Z18's build volume is. So this is 305 by 305 by 457 millimeters. So that's not that much. Um, so that is almost 12 inches, 11.8 inches by 12 by 18. So I get a couple extra inches on this guy. Um, so size actually did matter to me. The other thing is MakerBot as a company has been really crazy, flexible up and down. They hired a shit ton of people and then they let them all go. Uh, once they realize that they're, you know, trying to get 3D printing in stores, trying to be the Apple of 3D printing, wasn't working out. <clears throat> and they have these flash sales on a lot of printers time to time where they kind of over inventory and they have to get rid of them. So I would definitely recommend checking all the reviews and then uh, getting it. Um, looks like on Amazon, you know, just a simple, simple basic checking, it's got only two and a half stars and the price tag it's about double the race 3D's price tag. This one, the N2 Plus, uh, was 3500 which is the same price as the Form 2. So about the same price. So this printer, the Z18, to me, seems a bit excessive uh, for the cost. If that helps you see how I think about these printers. That is not a Z18 behind me. That is a race 3D N2 Plus. Uh, I can show you what that one is. Do, 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 do. All right, let's go to the images. <clears throat> yeah, so that's that one. I think they came up with a new one recently. It's like not even the N2 Plus. It's called something else. Yeah, so this one is a dual extruder, so I can run two filaments at the same time. And it is fully enclosed. Yeah, I, I can't say enough good things about the printers that I have. Uh, I've gone with both uh, companies that respond really well to support messages and chats because printing is a kind of a black art right now. Things don't always work out. All right, I'm going to double check the Facebook chat to see how that one's looking. Man, Facebook's content is just not on point right now. This whole ZBrush Live. Let me go to Pixelogic's actual site. and see if I can get to it that way. Do, 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 do. 
Yeah, that one's just strange. We'll have to come back to Facebook. Not sure why it's on the fritz. But I'm just going to keep streaming because y'all are here on Twitch. And let's get on with today's sculpt. So, I wanted to get this guy to the same point as these two. Um, and so, let's get it started. Make sure this window is small enough so you guys don't miss anything. And I will also resize this window. Pardon the flickering. Because I want you guys to see the bottom of my UI. So all of this is kind of my custom UI. I've got a bunch of brushes saved down here uh, as well as yeah <clears throat> so that's kind of where I adjust the lighting and then a bunch of different brushes and 3d printing related commands at the bottom also have a bunch of shortcut keys so I can like very quickly do a shortcut and get on with it <clears throat> okay so the first thing I want to do is work on some new eyes I tried something different with the eyes on this character, kind of much wider and less white, kind of cuter in a sense. Same thing here. And they're both kind of oval, so they're like a bit longer. <clears throat> the previous Fungusaurs uh, series that I had done had rounded eyes, all of them, and they were a bit white around, uh, they were mostly white. But I think that having the larger eyes, is just a bit more appealing. So let's take a look at what's going on here. This guy. So I've got some eyes here from the Dilophosaurus. So I'm just going to steal those. Scavenging parts all the time. And so I'm going to go to this character and click on Append the eyes. And there they are. You can see, you know, this whole character is scavenged. I started this guy originally from the Stego guy. That's why it's still named Stego, which I'm going to change, call it Iguano. And with these eyes appended, let's rotate them around. Whoa. Okay. Turn off solo mode and kind of move them into place. Now, there's many different ways to do this. I'm just kind of rolling with what I've got. I'm going to click auto groups just so they're, they each have their own poly group. That's blue, that's green, you can tell now. And I'm going to scale them up so that they're approximately the right size for my eyes. And then I'm going to do split. So I can do group split and it puts each in their own separate layer. So I can kind of position them individually. Turn off symmetry mode. Whoa, what if this character was a cyclops? That's a fun idea. A little cyclops dino. Yeah, I might do that later. Probably not for this guy, because I already have a second eye all laid out. Alright. I'll have to add some eyelids to this character. Scale this eye down a little bit. Position that nicely. Maybe move it out a bit. Maybe not. Maybe I'll move cut in a bit. So I'll switch to my damn standard tool, which is right here. And then give myself a bit more space. That's looking nice. It's a bit large though. So I'll click on it again. Scale it down. That looks a bit more proportional for what I'm going for. And I might end up changing these eyes entirely if I don't like them. Go back to the previous way I had done them or go to a different way entirely. Try to not get so much of it. Like I try to get the eyes, like the weird sculptural way I'm trying to go with these is to actually get a little bump for the pupil and a little concave for the 
uh, iris area. <clears throat> and that kind of, to me, just reads like, you know, when you actually print it out, you can see it. You can, you know where to paint, so it's really obvious. Alright, so that's looking neat. I might actually, instead of rolling with that one, I'll just toss that one and duplicate this existing one and move that. So what I normally do with the eyes is once I've figured out what I'm doing with them, I'll create an insert mesh brush and then just kind of draw them into place only where I need them, only where I want them. Right now, I'm just going to move this into place and we'll create some eyelids and we'll refine the sculpt a little bit. And then get started painting it. I also wanted to cover a bit of retopology in ZBrush today because I have to get cranking on my app that I'm trying to get done by November for these guys. No. And so for that app, I need to retopologize the original eight in the series. I guess I've done one, so seven of them. All right, let's get these eyeballs looking in the same direction, because that would be weird if they weren't. There we go. Yeah, that's mostly looking in the same direction. And I might scale this inward a little bit. Just so it's not bulging out too much. Don't be afraid to sculpt on your sculpts. That's what I say. And I'll probably change the eye color from green to something else eventually anyway. Cool. And then, just kind of getting this in place, damn standarding, smoothing, moving. I like this bridge of the nose, so I don't want to interrupt that too much. I do like when these creatures or characters have little obvious ridges for their eyebrows, because that makes them a lot more expressive. You work on that ridge a little bit. I might actually pull that forward just to give me more area to play with. And let me check. I think I was sculpting this with Sculptress Pro mode off and then just dynameshing. Yeah, 100 resolution. Let me crank that up to 200. Yeah, that preserves most of my detail. And that gives me enough resolution to just kind of smooth around. Digital Armory is talking about the Z18. It's saying can be a really great printer but needs some workarounds implemented. The heated build chamber allows you to do a large scale ABS prints with less trouble. That's true. Having a heated chamber, that means basically closed off from the external world. Um, simple as putting a glass or plexiglass door on it. It keeps the temperature inside really stable. Uh, by the time you do all the workarounds, it can be easier to just add a chamber heater to the Raise 3D. Good point. <laughs> uh, this one actually does come with a full closed off uh, printer. So it, it is not a heat chamber, but it is very easy to regulate the temperature in this thing. All right, Brave Hun's asking, and how are you exporting the ZBrush file to print with what software turning into a printable file? <laughs> um, so that is just ZBrush. I go to the ZBrush Z plugin 3D Print Hub. I figure out the scale that I want, usually in inches, about three inches tall or so. And then uh, I'll export that out to STL or send it to Preform and try to prototype them on this Form 2 you see back here. Uh, Joanne saying he looks sort of deranged with that original eye showing through the new one. Definitely. It's part of the process. Everything looks really ugly until it doesn't. Okay. So let's refine this sculpt. 
the good thing about this being kind of a personal IP and project is that I'm not afraid to try things. So just make really large sweeping changes and see if it helps the character. I feel like that change actually did. Give him a little long snout. Kind of makes him more gecko-like, but also makes him more a bit relatable. Versus doing the big rounded snout makes him a bit cuter. You can play around with both these ideas. I'm going to smooth that. I'll switch to my clay brush. Try to fill in some of this eyebrow here. And along the edges. Same on this end. Make sure I have a nice ridge. Then come in with the damn standard. That's looking much nicer already. Okay, so the next step now for me, I pinch this a bit, smooth it out. You can kind of come in and like do a little pinch around this and you get the idea of what I'd be doing, uh, at least on in terms of the plane. But I don't need to do that because that'll mess up these uh, nostrils, which I really like the positioning of. So instead, I'll just use the H polish brush. Just kind of do a little bit of polish. And that'll do the, have the same effect. All right, neat. That tongue crease, make it really obvious. And now it's looking a little bug-eyed because those eyes are so massive and there's no eyelids at all. So you can try a couple of different things. I can try to shrink these eyes a little bit. So let me merge both of them together and scale them down a bit, just a tad. And then I can try to add some eyelids. So there's a few different ways of adding eyelids. The easiest one that I found, which I like doing, is to duplicate these eyes and just kind of cut them in half. So I'll just use my clip curve brush or my trim brush. So let's see, where's the trim? Trim lasso. And I'll just drag. Whoop. was supposed to try to control shift drag. There we go. There. That's so strange. Okay. And so that basically trimmed and got rid of the bottom halves of the mesh. And I'm going to save before I crash because that was a bit scary. Go to stream 10, Iguano, let's call him 4. <coughs> And I'm going to dynamesh these guys at a pretty low resolution. Because I'm basically just looking for the starting uh, mesh. And just smooth them out, smooth them out. Probably go even lower with the dynamesh resolution. Just really smooth them out and inflate and inflate. And turn off solo. And then now we should be able to start seeing them coming through. And I'll just move those around and use some other brushes like my clip brush, clip curve, and hold control shift to kind of clip away any of the part I don't want. Dynamesh again, this time probably at a higher resolution. What happened? Oh, that's 1232. That is way too high. I was going for 128. There we go. And just kind of move these pieces around until it looks right. And the ridge, because it's 3D printing, guys, you got to think about this ridge in terms of, you know, will it read at that scale that you're printing at? 
everything needs to basically be able to read which means when you're looking at it from far away will you still be able to see it so if this ridge was really really small because this is about the scale these guys will be printing you have to get this stuff to the scale that you want to see it at so you'll know if your detail is going to look good Okay, do something like that. I'm hesitant to do too much of an undercut because it might be more trouble than it's worth because I don't think, you know, a lot of factories have problems with undercuts that are too deep. But I can try a little bit. And I can always, you know, get rid of it later if I want. All right, that's looking good. And I need this back space to be even larger to accommodate. This big eye, big old eye. And sometimes it can be problematic not sculpting these characters at symmetry because then I have to fix everything on both sides manually. But I often find it's worth it because you're going to get something that's more organic and appealing. And then later, once you're done with the concept, then you can pose it for retopology. Make that eye a bit longer. Every time I look at it from a different angle, I see, oh, I should clean that up. I should clean that up. All part of the process. Make those cheeks a bit cheekier, poofier. This is really the fun part of working on a character for me is to work on the face, to refine that, make it better and more uh, relatable, cute, appealing. Get rid of the bumps. And kind of reinforce what you want to reinforce. All right, that's looking good. I like what's happening here where it just kind of bleeds off and you don't see any unnecessariness. Now these dinos don't have ears but they do usually have a little ear hole so I don't know how accurate I want to be to the anatomy. If I want to be really accurate I can come in and add that later. Alright, smooth that out. All right, great. Might actually come in and inflate this a bit too. Cool. All right, so that looks good for a couple of the eyelids on the top, and I'll duplicate these to do the eyelids for the bottom. One thing with eyelids is that they tend to be lifted up more on top of the pupil area. And then they can be a bit lower along the sides. But eyelids actually convey a lot of different emotion of your character. If you have the eyelids really droopy, then the character is going to look sleepy or sad. You know what, let's turn on some music for this. Let's see here. All right. 
little limited in what kind of music I can play. Looking for royalty free tracks. This one is called World Cup Football Motivational. <laughs> Alright, let's do this one. Modern Confident Hip Hop. Huh, not bad. All right, back at it. Oh wait, I hate that. I hate it when it says audio jungle or something like that in the middle of my music. Let's see here. Do 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 do. Damn. Now that one's lame. Let's just go to something else. Hmm. All right, better. Okay, back at it with some synth wave. All right, that's looking good. Might do a little bit of undercut here as well. Turn on solo mode. Damn standard. All right. Cool. Then I'll duplicate these eyes. And rotate it around. Or these eyelids, I should say. So it's Monday morning here for me in LA. Not sure what time it is where you guys are all at viewing this but what are you guys up to any personal projects of yours that you're working on I know it's hard to find time to work on personal art projects that's my main problem I just have too many projects I want to do in addition to you know all the actual work that I do probably I'm going to a paid gig after this these days I'm working for Hero Forge. It's a 3D printed miniatures collectible company called Sky Castle Studios. And I'm modeling and rigging stuff for them, character stuff for print and mini scale. All right, see with the bottom eyelid, I tried to make that a bit smaller. If you make that too big, character looks tired and don't want the character looking tired. It needs a little bit more poof though. Poofiness to it. Yeah, you don't always even need a bottom eyelid. If you do something like this, the character looks like he's smiling, which is kind of cute. I might play around with that. Do a couple of iterations of this eyelid. Interesting. Let me duplicate it. And try doing that with both eyelids. Give him a bit of a smile. They say eyes are the windows to the soul. 
I don't know about that, but I know that eyes are involved in your smile. So whenever you smile, your eyes smile too. Unless you're a total psychopath. In which case, that probably doesn't happen. I don't know. If you're a real psychopath, you could probably fake it. Trying this out. Come back in with the damn standard tool, holding Alt to kind of in create a ledge there. Obvious one. Now, in theory, the eyelid would actually come to meet each other at the edges. I don't have to stick to theory. This is a cartoon. I can do whatever I want. Alright, so the problem with this, with his both his bottom eyelids kind of doing this smile motion, is that to me he's looking either a bit tired or stoned, which is not a good thing for a kid's IP. So let's try doing the opposite. Let's try doing both the eyes kind of open. At least in the front. Switching between my move and my inflate tool. Let's try to make these meet a little bit. See if I like that. Don't dislike it. That's better. It's one th reason I like to character design in ZBrush is I feel more like a sculptor, like I'm coming up with it on the fly. When I do it on paper, I kind of just draw and like my drawings are very sculptural. Like I keep adding lines until I get something that resembles what I see in my head. So it's not really technically good drawings. Playing with this ridge a bit more, with this cheek line. Seeing if I want to add some sharpness there. Probably not. Get rid of it. Go back to damn standard. Thinking about the snout again. Do I want that snout to be a bit larger? I don't know. Let's take a look at the actual Iguanodon. Looking at the reference, it's a duck-billed dinosaur. It's got a pretty flat... It doesn't even have a nose, really. It's got, like, a flat... Just direct from the head. And it's a duck-billed dinosaur, so it's got that big beak at the end. Definitely like the beak at the end. I don't know if I like having just a direct 
that's basically more accurate to what the dinosaur looks like. And it's a fine balance here, trying to find that accuracy and trying to find a fun character. You can't be afraid to change stuff though. You gotta change it up. You gotta be willing to. Willing to barrel forward with reckless abandon. And symmetry is very appealing to our eyes, so try to make things as symmetrical as you can. looking better. Let's go ahead and color these eyes all the same color. Let's actually start thinking in color right now. It'll help me find the appeal of this character. I might change up the snout again. <laughs> we'll see. I do want to emphasize that beak somehow. Okay. So instead of the sculpting material, I'm going to switch to skin shade. And I'll go ahead with MRGB on at 100%. Just fill object. I'll do that for the eyes as well. Combining or merging the top and bottom eyelids. And doing a color fill object. <laughs> Let's find the base color for this character. And we'll keep sculpting even with uh, a bit of color. This part is symmetrical. I like that. Sometimes it's good to change up your materials so you're not really getting caught up on something that the material is giving you that's not in the sculpt. Brave Hun says, I'm working on a bunny toy for learning. That's cool, man. <laughs> Open his mouth a little bit. He looks like he's bitten down on his tongue. I get your point. Let's see. Maybe. I do want the tongue to be like kind of sticking out. Like, like he's doing that whole artist thing, you know. Like,
Okay. So the color I'm going to be doing, the color scheme, <coughs> is basically a bit of purples and yellows. But let me see. I don't want it to be too yellow. I want a little bit of yellow. I have to look up more images of this two-colored bullet. It's like yellow on the bottom of the frame uh, of the mushroom. <coughs> Peachish, kind of going into purple. Yeah, so it's kind of yellow bleeding into a darker color at the bottom. There's the eyes. Not sure what that is. I think these are all the different hair stuff I was showing in a question I was asked. That's how the model started. Okay. So with a slightly purple pinkish color. Now he's looking already very quickly a lot like the Dilophosaurus character. <clears throat> if I go too similar in color palette then they won't stand out from each other. So I have to make sure that they don't go too similar in color palette. So maybe this guy, I'll start with more of a base of yellow and then add the purple. And the pinks. So I'll switch to my standard brush with the color spray on, turn off Z add, start spraying. A bit more yellow at the bottom here because that's the color of the bottom of the mushroom. And then add some of these pinks and purples up top. That's way too pink. And the RGB intensity is way too strong. There we go. Coloring these guys really helps to bring them to life for me, for sure. Looks like it's a bit darker up at the top too, so I'll go with a bit darker. Start adding a bit of that in there. Let's see what it's like if I completely darken the top. I need to look at more examples of this. I'm gonna get rid of the whole. Uh, I don't know, Google search changed it up so it's not as useful with the large anymore. All right, so it looks like it's a bit darker at the top, gets lighter as you go down to the bottom. It really depends on the lighting scenario. I like that bit of yellow uh, that peeks out along the edge. It kind of helps reinforce the look here. All right, so we want that yellow bleeding down into the pink. <laughs> Here we go. So yellow bleeding down into this pinky, purpley color. And peeking out around the edge too, either in crack form or in line form. And I think this is a bit cuter because if it's a baby, you can imagine that it's fresher and peeking out like that. Cool. Spawn House saying, I love how you explain stuff while you do it. So I try, man. It's part of my process. 
Because it's not coming up out of thin air. If any artist is telling you it comes up out of thin air, they're lying. It's a lot of reference. It's a lot of looking at what you're doing, comparing, making mistakes. All right, let's add more of that yellow. I can pick a specific color by dragging and dropping my picker tool. Let's try to bring that halo in around the edge. Might even go whiter. There we go. I'll hit that a few more times and reinforce it. Hit a bit of this yellow too along the bottom. Get rid of the pink around the edges. And this way, I don't have back face masking on. So anytime I'm coloring here, it's kind of going up around the edge, which is fine with me. I like a little bit of the bleed here. Yeah, definitely need to refine the model a bit more. But I need to start getting my thoughts out in color. Okay. Go with a little bit of that pink again and start painting it down here. The size of your brush stroke really makes a huge impact. And I want the bottoms to be almost completely this dark purple and then kind of building up to the yellow. I think the first place I heard of this two-colored bullet was this little mushroom hunting catalog that I picked up. Yeah, and this one's got a really nice photo of it, or drawing of what it should look like. So lots of yellows and pinks and kind of like stretches, you know? Like, kind of like this Alpha 58. This first pass is never really what I end up using for the final, but it is a good way to start. So this looks pretty significantly different from this one. Because this is more of a purple purple versus this one I'm going with more of a pinkish. So I think it'll read.
turn off my alpha entirely or go with a really soft one like 35 kind of bring in some more of the pink into this <coughs> Look at a more reference on the side. Yeah, it's nice if I can keep the yellow kind of contained to more of the face area. And then it'll draw your eyes upwards to the face. Ugh. Versus if the whole body is yellow. But it really depends which reference you're looking at, you know? Like this one, you can see the whole base is yellow. And then these, you can see that the kind of reddish pink is bleeding up into the yellow. Card saying add a bit of the red to just the spiked thumbs. That's a good idea. Help to highlight them. Let's see. <laughs> That's a bit too red. That's just like like he straight up murdered someone with those arms, those thumbs. <laughs> Alright, let's just go with the darker color though. Can't hurt to add some darks in there. I'm going to switch from my color spray to just freehand and start painting in some occlusion where the shadows would be for this character. That'll help to really define the shape a bit better. And in toys, there is no 3D rendering. You do have to try to get as much of the shape described by the color as you can. I'm going to select with my mask, let's do mask rectangle. I'll just select just the bottom, draw a mask over it, tap control along the sides, soften that mask. And I can do a color fill object. That'll just make the feet flat. So I don't need to think about the color at the bottom of the feet. It's okay if it bleeds down a little bit though. Might actually go with white for the thumbs. Let's see what, what's going on with the actual Iguana Dawn. What color do they usually make those thumbs? Those are pretty bright and white, same with the toes. <coughs> they change it up. Obviously we're working off of artist renderings most of the time because we don't know what these dinos look like. Dinosaur had them dark. Yeah, you can see in this one they're pretty dark. We'll try both. Let's try darkening these up.
Kind of like what's happening there. Just playing with it a bit more. I don't know how warm-blooded we want to make them, but we should color the tongue as well. Let's go with the pink for the tongue. Really pink. It's probably too pink. Add some more red into there. Add some red into the eyes as well. As if they're letting a bit of light through. But not too much. See if I can add a line along the bottom of the eyelid. Let's harden this. Now for mass production, it's not likely that they'll be able to do this kind of detailed painting. But when you first come up with the concept of a character, you should just go wild with it. Have fun. I think about mass production in terms of engineering, but not always in terms of paint. Because I want to find the ideal before I compromise. Definitely draws more attention to the eye, that's for sure. It's probably too much black. But I can tone it down later. See, I'm going to click auto groups. Let me save this file again. So strange. Okay. After auto grouping, I should be able to just control shift click and look at the part I've got selected. Turn off the eyes. Just paint that alone. Hmm. Gotta be careful you don't paint too much of the top, too. But I think that part's mostly hidden. Yep. Alright, so I did blue eyes for this character. That was more of a green character. 
These are the Dilophosaurus eyes, which I pulled into the iguano. Those are green. I don't know if I'm digging the green eyes on them. Could try a different, few different colors. But I'm not sure if I'm digging the body paint just yet either. I'm going to add a bit more yellow to the face. Try to brighten that up. Kind of make it keep your attention. And not sure if we want to exaggerate the duck bill but I can maybe try to color it in. Hope it doesn't look like a mustache. That totally looks like a mustache. Well, worth a shot. Let's try instead to just color the end. See if that reads better. Kind of looks like a dark upper lip. That may not be a bad thing. <laughs> Droopy nose. I don't know. This doesn't seem to be working with the duck bill. So I'm going to undo that. You just gotta have an eye for this kind of thing, like what, what does work, what doesn't work. If it doesn't, you skip it. But I will add a bit more of this yellow in, because I like that. See what happens when I try to bring a bigger bit of this pink down into the yellow. If I add too much to the cheeks, it kind of looks like blush. And if I had too much to the below the eyelid, it looks like kind of like a bruise. So you have to find a nice balance. And I thought this would read better than it does um, the color combination. Because it looks so cute and cool on the character there. Let's see what if I do just more pink overall. Use the yellow for highlight, but have it mostly be a pink paint job. Looks a bit like Barney. Good old Barney. Purple Dino. Just trying to simplify and make a bit more of just pink overall. And then I can bring in the yellow for highlight.
See, I'm liking that better already. Sometimes you have to work through it. It's not working. Keep hitting it until it works. I like the nose being so yellow. Oh, too much. Hope you guys are learning something from this process, just seeing me work through the paint, figure out how the character should look. Don't want to give him too much dark shadow down here, otherwise it'll look like he's got a 5 o'clock shadow. And it looked very old, which I don't want. I do like how this kind of jaw bleeds into the cheek, which I don't have going on here as much. I'm going to switch to Z-Add and Clay, kind of bring that in. Make sure my RGB is off when I smooth. That way it's only smoothing the geometry, not the color. All right, now that we've got this figured out, let's try to change up the snout shape again and see if it's getting cuter or not. No, not necessarily. That's too big. It doesn't look like the same species anymore. If I do too much of that, it looks more like an aggressive kind of meat eater. So I don't want to do that either. Let's see. Let's bleed the yellow that we've got into the back a bit as well. Kind of see if we can take it down into the tail. This adds another level of, you know, detail and appeal to the character. You don't want it to only be interesting in the head. You want it to be interesting all the way around. It's an interesting thought maybe that wherever the sun hits it more, it kind of is yellowish more. Needs a bit more in the front now too, maybe up on the arms.
like a bit of this striped effect that's happening too. Good to add some pattern now and then. I'm going to darken these wrinkles too so you can see them again. Not sure about darkening these back wrinkles, but a little bit. Let's try. <coughs> I do like trying to get more of this yellow into the pink. Let's keep trying that. Again, you've seen, if I don't like it, just skip it. Or go back to it. Just paint over it. Let's try some, a couple of different things also. Let's see what would happen. If... I like a little bit of yellow there. Maybe a little bit, not too much. Hmm. It's either hit or miss. Yeah, if we're going with the yellow kind of being wherever the sun hits, then it wouldn't hit the chest that much. It might hit the top of it. Add a little bit of yellow there. Yeah, interesting. And definitely more on the feed then too. Nine forty. Got about twenty minutes to start wrapping this up. Looks like I'm gonna get to retopology next week, and at that point we'll start retopologizing a character and start talking a bit about augmented reality as well. I still have to play around with this a bit more, really figure it out. So I'm gonna stay on that for the rest of the stream. Let's try making these white. Let's see if those read better. At the end, we're trying to create something cute and appealing. And if that means going lighter instead of darker, and that's what we'll do. See. I'm going to save that. And let's go back and forth. Huh? Thinking about it. Or 
we go. Christopher Dean 3D says, hey, Eamon, looking good. What's up, Chris? Good to see you on here. Chris is an awesome 3D artist. You guys should follow him as well. He makes the coolest characters now, and he's getting better every year. Seagull Rush. I just had mushrooms. <laughs> nice. Let's see. Side Effects is asking, did you make any flying dino? Don't remember. Um, yeah, I did. There was... Just the one, I think, so far, which is that guy right there, the little tarot cap. It's a uh, death cap mushroom mixed with a pterodactyl. I don't know if I have a better picture of it. Aha, there. Yeah, so I thought like maybe actually giving it two mushroom wings would be fun, and it's it's one where the back actually looks more like a mushroom than the front. And I thought of the death cap mushroom because it's kind of white from the bottom. So when it's flying, you wouldn't really see it up against the sky. But when it's on the ground, the top is all green. So it can cover itself up and look like it's uh, on the, uh, like, part of the greenery. Hmm. I think I took some photos of it on location. No, I guess not. Not there. But yeah, just the one flying dinosaur so far. I do want to make a couple more. I want to make a Dimorphodon. That one's really cool. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Dimorphodon. It's like straight up dragon. Like it's the closest thing to a dragon that actually existed. And it's more of a gliding creature than a straight up flyer. Like I don't think Dimorphodon could fly for long distances. I could... It could get up on the top of a mountain and kind of wingsuit dive off for a little bit. Well, I always thought these were really cute. And they have that giant head, which is already a really good, uh, you know, kind of appeal booster. Because it makes a creature look more childlike and kitty when it's got that big of a head. But yeah, that's definitely one I want to do soon, a Dimorphodon. I want to add a couple of swimmers as well. So not just have the land ones, but also some water ones and some air ones. Brave Hun saying, Crocos also dinos. That's true. Crocs were dinosaurs. Or they were round in the time of dinosaurs. They just kind of perfected their evolution so they didn't need to go anywhere. Chicken's a dino. <laughs> On that note, I have something that I found recently. Which I was getting a kick out of. What do you guys think? Do you think this is what really happened? <laughs> I mean, to an extent, there is a lot of fossil record that proves that dinosaurs turned into modern day birds. Um... Actually, the largest ones apparently are the ones that turned into birds because the largest ones, when dinosaurs got really big, they evolved hollow bones because they were just so big that they couldn't, you know, the bones, if they were solid, wouldn't be able to keep the creatures, uh, they would fall over. They would be too heavy. So the hollow bones actually evolved from really gigantic size. So then when whatever catastrophe happened that caused them to start dying off and adapting, they kind of shrunk and shrunk and shrunk till they turn into birds. But who knows? It's kind of like one of those eternal debates. Because we can't really know what happened. <coughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> if there ever was a dinosaur toucan, it was a dimorphodon. Good point, yeah. It had that giant toucan beak kind of thing going on. All right. Oof. All right. It's good to take your eyes off of these things time to time so you can look at them. I'll draw them side by side. Take it up in history. <clears throat> and I like to do this as just a visual cue for me. If Zebras doesn't crash, that is.
All right, cool. All right, we're probably going to get distracted by the little bit of yellow that I've added to this that I hadn't added there. But just looking at it, trying to blur my eyes and seeing the white nails versus the black nails, what works better? Mm. The white adds a bit of, you know, like really obvious, like attention drawing feature to the thumb. <coughs> but it might be too white now. Versus the black or the darkish brown on the thumbs and toes. It kind of brings your attention to it, but it doesn't steal your attention from anywhere else. So you know what? I think I'm going to go with the dark. So let's find the point in the history where we started painting those white and undo. Some people saying white is better. I might end up going back to the white eventually, but I think for now, I'm going to keep it on the dark side. Alright, cool. I do want to change up the geometry here so it's really obvious what's going on with the feet and where to paint them. So I'm going to come in here and I will select the bottom. Actually, perspective mode is on, so I want to turn that off and then select the bottom. All right, masking the bottom just so I don't have to worry about it changing so much as I sculpt around it. I want to kind of make some nails. Actually, you know what? I should do this with symmetry on because I think these feet are symmetrical. Yeah. No sense doing something twice when you can do it just once. All right, Get that really obvious edge crease so I know where it's at. The pinch brush to refine it, move it around to refine it. So sometimes color just helps you figure out your sculpt. So there's no such thing as sculpting only in black and white or clay or there's no right way is my point I guess. You can sculpt and create your own process. Okay. That's looking good. I'm gonna come in here with the stamps with the standard brush again and kind of paint that entire nail that black color or brownish color. And I think I had symmetry on, so it should be doing both sides at the same time. That's good. Fix some of this. It looks right. Great. Now, I don't know if you guys know a lot about nails, but they're usually made of chitin on, in us. It's a little shiny property material. And so what I want to do is kind of add a bit more shine into these nails. 
And the easiest way to do that is to just go with white and kind of make a little hint of it. Hint of shine. And kind of change the specular highlight based on the shape of it. Or to, to really describe the shape of it. Which is that it's a claw, it's a little pointy part. So it can be a bit brighter up at the top. You can kind of pull that idea into the white of the thumbs as well. Have a bit more specular highlight on it. So it's not completely dark. You can do a bit of both, a little bit of white and a little bit of dark. Use that white sparingly on your body as well, because these are mushrooms, you know, they're a bit slimy creatures. So you can come in and add some highlights. Go with the darker color again. Don't want to compare myself to one of the greatest, but Renaissance artist Michelangelo used to say that he's just pulling stuff out of the marble <coughs> that's already there. Because people were asking him, how does he do it? How does he see all this stuff in there? But it was already there, he says. And he just kind of chiseled it out. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. It's what I'm trying to do every time. Is to find the appeal of the character that's kind of already there. Let's see. And add some more of this uh, dotty texture to the bottom of the mushroom because this one doesn't have gills it has this kind of foamy bit to it and I'll think about surface texture overall later right now I just kinda wanna refine it And I can just use my pinch brush to pinch that in if I want to. Inflate, pinch. <coughs> it's a balance. Balance between wearing a mushroom hat and actually being a mushroom. You gotta find that balance. And make it cute to boot. All right, let's see if we can play around with some texture again. I'll bring in the Alpha 58 with a bit of yellow on it and see if we like it. Not with Z add, oof. RGB. <clears throat> mm 
bring in some more of the pink. Okay, I'm skipping forward to the next track. Okay, let's see what you guys are saying on Twitch. Took off a day off my latest scalp, and now I know what to do next. Perfect, I'm glad I was able to help. Turn it into dust, okay. Small model he made in the container of water, then drained the water slowly away from the model, raised up the model as he worked on the larger final sculpture. Oh, you're talking about Michelangelo, that's true. Yeah, his part of his process, I haven't heard that part specifically, but I'm sure water was heavily involved because marble will chip really poorly if it's not, uh, you know, relatively soaked or, you know, uh, the, from what, what I've seen is even when you're dremeling or working with stone at all, uh, you want to have liquid there so it's not, uh, you know, just breaking willy-nilly. That said, they didn't have power tools, so they kind of chiseled away at it. I'm sure I'll have to look more into his process. I did get to see a lot of it this time when I went to uh, Rome back in September. All right, going a bit dark again. Turn off the alphas. My favorite Renaissance sculptor, though, if I had to pick, is not Michelangelo. It would be a tie either between Caravaggio, who's more of a painter, or, uh, you know, not even Renaissance, but, uh, let's see, let me find this sculptor, <clears throat> Rodin, August Rodin. I feel like he kind of took it to the ultimate level as far as expressionism in his sculpt. So if you look at a lot of Rodin sculptures, they're very expressive. They're dynamic. They're really pushing the boundaries. He did the famous thinker uh, that I'm sure you guys have seen. Um, what else? That He did like this really famous one called the Gates of Hell, which has a ton of different statues built into it. Let's see. Let me go with tool size large. So this is definitely one of my favorite sculptors just because of his expressiveness in all of his sculpts. And in, and in the actual technique, it's very, uh, you know, not, not smooth, it's not perfect. He makes the hands larger than they would be. He makes uh, a lot of the marks are visible on the mesh, uh, on the sculpt that he's doing. But yeah, definitely look up Auguste Rodin. There's the Gates of Hell sculpture. You can see all the different sculpts going on in it. <laughs> Brave Hunt saying, I want to go back in time to give him a 3D printer. No, it's true. It's crazy to imagine, like, we're just working with the technologies that we have available. If I didn't have anything like 3D printing available, I would probably try to work in marble. But can you imagine if you gave those guys, like Da Vinci, for example, a 3D printer, what he would do with it? It'd be crazy. It'd be crazy. Because he was inventing so many things as he went along. But you know what they had back then they did, don't have now was patrons. Like We don't have patrons. It's very hard to be a professional artist making time for personal works and projects without having some backing and support. To just have the free time to do it all. You have to buy the time to do it all. And also then find the balance between doing work that you think will get you hired. So doing more, you know, professional development kind of work. And doing work just for the sake of fun. Like what is 
fun for you. Do more of that. Because that's where the really good stuff was going to come out of anyway, is the stuff that's fun for you. All right. On that note, it is 10 o'clock, so I'm going to wrap up this stream. Let's take a look at this character as we are leaving him off today. And we'll probably revisit him again later. You know, that is looking too much like chest hair or something, so I'm going to simplify that paint job a bit. Bring in that pink again. Just hint at it more than be fully committed to it. There we go. And maybe darken it a bit more too. Darken that belly. All right, perfect. His legs looking a bit spindly or skinny from this angle. I might go in and inflate that. I should do a print prototype of him and see if I want to change it up. But so far, pretty happy with how he turned out. I'll likely keep working at it and try to figure out how to make him a bit more appealing and a bit more printer friendly. And yeah, let's keep at it. Thanks for joining me in this part of the stream. Let's see. Here. E104. Good luck this week working on your own personal projects, guys. Highly encourage you to. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's see. Bravehound saying, great man. Let's see. Thanks. Be so much saying, you're so good. I'm okay. <laughs> Let's see. Joanne saying, that's why a lot of work by artists was portraiture for private clients and allegorical work for the church. Yeah, they were the big uh, patrons back in the day. The church, the bishop, the saints. Oh, thank you for joining me for this stream. So cool to hear about your uncle who was a stonemason, Joanne. That's awesome. I'd love to make a gargoyle for a cathedral. Hashtag life goals. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Signing off now. Thanks again for joining. And see me next week, Monday, where we'll talk a bit more about retopology, show you the print prototype for this guy, and then we'll take it from there. Laters.